So can you unmute, Monique, and confirm your audio connection since you'll be speaking shortly? All right, am I, am I all set now, Steve? I think you're unmuted. I can hear you loud and clear. So, Great, thank you. Yeah, hold on a second and I'll introduce you as, uh, I've got TimeWise 705, so if folks join us, they will, um, and welcome to them. But for those who came on time and early, we appreciate that. Oh, there's two more coming in. So that'll be good. They'll be able to catch right at the intro. <clears throat> All right, for those who just joined, we're just about to begin. You haven't missed anything. Uh, the agenda you should be able to see on the screen for those connected via computer or smart thing. Um, I'll introduce Monique Dill who introduce our speakers. Uh, Stuart will do a presentation, Barry will do some remarks, and then we'll get into the, the, the key piece where uh, this questions and answers, questions and discussions um, will happen as well. So Monique, all yours. Thank you, Steve, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, I would like to also thank Steve, uh, who is going to act as the moderator for our webinar. And I'd also like to thank all of the committee members who have been working hard, and I've been seeing lots of signs popping up around town. I'd like to first introduce to you Stuart Saganmore. Saganmore, excuse me. He joined the Trust for the Public Land as the Executive Director of the Coalition in May 2006. He served as Chair of the Community Preservation Committee in Boxford for five years. He is the executive director of the Community Preservation Coalition. Stewart has helped almost 100 cities and towns in Massachusetts adopt the Community Preservation Act, and most recently spearheaded last year's efforts to increase the state funding for the CPA by 150%. He was given the Lewis Conservation Award honoring his deep commitment to conservation and environmental sustainability through his work on the Community Preservation Act. And this was given by the Sudbury Valley Trustees. So I'd like to welcome Stuart to our webinar tonight and he will be explaining the first part of our program. Thank you very much, Stuart be here. Thank you, Monique, for that uh, introduction. Almost didn't recognize myself there. Um, so we'll step you through some of the basics of CPA this evening. And um, then, as Monique said, I'm happy to stick around and, and uh, Barry as well to answer any questions that folks might have about uh, CPA. Uh, Steve is going to run the slides for us tonight, and um, we'll kick it off with an explanation of um, what CPA is. So, um, the state has something called enabling legislation, which means that the legislature passes a framework for a law, but nothing happens unless communities adopt it at the local level. And CPA is uh, enabling legislation that uh, Governor Salucci signed in 2000. You can see him over on the right side of the screen there with uh, Jane Swift signing the CPA legislation in September of 2000. Um, so once the, the legislature gave us this framework, then individual communities can decide whether CPA is right for them. And um, if they're interested in looking at the program, a town meeting must vote to approve it, and then it goes on the ballot at a local election or a state election, whichever is the next to come. And so in Franklin and some other communities in the state, um, you'll be voting on CPA on the November 3rd election. Next slide, Steve. So what happens when you adopt CPA? Well, if the majority of the voters say they do want to program in um, Franklin, what you are doing is creating a local restricted fund. Um, unlike the general budget of the town, this money um, is restricted to quality of life uh, issues, um, historic preservation and preserving the historic buildings and structures and documents and artifacts that really are important to Franklin. Um, open space and recreation. By open space, we mean traditional conservation land, uh, forest fields, some um, agricultural land, wetlands, uh, pond frontage, things like that. 
And then recreation is the more active um, outdoor activities. So parks, playgrounds, athletic fields, um, community gardens, trails, um, those are all the things that make up the outdoor recreation part of CPA. And then the last of the four pieces is community housing, uh, which is housing for folks who earn up to 100% of the area-wide median income in Franklin. So CPA has been around, like I said, for 20 years. And in that time, um, about half the cities and towns, a little over half actually, have uh, adopted the program, 177. For those of you that are true Massachusetts lovers, you'll know that we have 351 cities and towns in the Commonwealth. So about half the municipalities have it, but it actually uh, covers about 62% of the population. So 62% of the people that live in Massachusetts now live in a city or town that has CPA. Um, at some point, I'm sure we'll find a community that um, is not happy with the program anymore and wants to leave uh, because communities can uh, vote it out uh, the same way it was voted in. But uh, remarkably, we have never had a community um, revoke CPA. Uh, every community that has adopted it has really found the program incredibly beneficial to the quality of life in their community. And uh, like I said, no one has ever revoked the program. Any way you look at CPA, whether you look at it uh, in terms of the number of communities that have it, 177, or um, even more importantly, what's been done with the funding. So this is um, the latest statistics through the end of FY19. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, Chase Mack, our communications director of the coalition today is actually working on crunching the numbers from FY20 uh, that the state has collected. And in a couple of days, we'll actually have um, an update on these numbers. Um, historic preservation is the, the largest category um, on CPA. Almost half the appropriations have been for historic projects, um, 5,500 out of the 12,000 total. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that more money has been spent on historic preservation because the projects in that category tend to be a little smaller. But and actually, the, the money kind of rolls up fairly evenly across the four categories um, when you look at it statewide. With open space, we've seen uh, just over 30,000 acres that have been protected um, through conservation restrictions um, across the Commonwealth. Outdoor recreation, those parks, playgrounds, athletic fields I talked about, that is definitely the um, hottest and most popular category of CPA over the past few years. And that's because the legislature made some tweaks to CPA in 2012. Um, that made it a little easier and more um, flexible for communities to use that category. So we've seen really um, tremendous growth in the number of parks and playgrounds that have been built and rehabilitated uh, under CPA and community gardens and skateboard parks. Um, the hottest thing right now is pickleball courts. We have a couple dozen communities that have built pickleball courts in the last couple of years. Uh, tennis courts, basketball, really anything uh, in terms of outdoor recreation or outdoor parks uh, or playgrounds um, are, are fair game in that category. And then in the last category, affordable housing, we've had uh, over 17,000 units that have either been built with CPA funding um, or supported in some other way. So um, when you add it all up, it's really incredible that in 20 years, the program has raised $2.35 billion um, for these quality of life issues. And the great thing about CPA is that money is a mix of both the local money that communities contribute on their own and the state matching money, but every decision that is made on where to spend that money and which of these projects to do that you see on the screen is all made locally uh, by your town meeting in a, in a town or city council in a, in a city or town council, some communities like yours call their city council a town council. Um, so coming up next month, or just in a couple of weeks, we have nine different communities that are uh, voting on CPA on the November 3rd ballot. Um, a couple of them in your area, Franklin um, is very close to Framingham, just up the road and, and Hopedale, a few towns over. Um, Shrewsbury and actually is not too far either. Um, so um, we're very excited to see all the different communities that are voting on CPA this year. The list is at the top of your screen. Um, and, um, and it's actually a pretty incredible that, um, you know, in the middle of uh, what's going on with the pandemic and the election and all that, that um, these nine communities really have um, seen the benefits of putting CPA on the ballot and letting the voters decide whether they wanted to adopt the program. Next slide, Steve. 
All right, so let's get into um, how the money flow of CPA works, because that seems to be what folks are always most interested in. So when you adopt CPA at the ballot, um, you are actually putting a small surcharge on your local property taxes. Um, in Franklin's case, uh, that surcharge will be 2% of the tax, not of the property value. Um, sometimes folks make that mistake, but it's of the, of the annual tax um, with some exemptions that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, communities can choose up to 3%, um, and in Franklin, the uh, town council decided uh, on a 2% figure. Um, so that local money goes into your local community preservation program, uh, and then every November 15th, you get matching money from the state. Um, the trust fund uh, brings in um, anywhere from 60 to $80 million now. As I mentioned, uh, or as Monique mentioned before, actually the legislature just increased the amount of funding that's dedicated from the Registry of Deeds um, to CPA. And so we've seen a big jump in, in funding for those uh, matches that come every November 15th. Um, so there are also um, exemptions available, and, and you can go on, Steve, we'll talk about those in a second. Um, but uh, let's continue on with the, with the trust fund because that's really, honestly, the most exciting part of CPA from a money perspective is the fact that communities that agree to add a small surcharge on their local property taxes are guaranteed um, annual money from the statewide CPA trust fund every November 15th. And that's really the magic of CPA, honestly. Um, the trust fund is a true trust fund. It is um, administered by the Department of Revenue. Um, the money comes from fees that are charged at the Registry of Deeds, and those fees were just increased. They had never been raised in 20 years. Um, so it was really long overdue for the legislature to consider raising those fees, and they did that um, this past January 1st. Um, and that money goes from the registry right to a lockbox at the Department of Revenue, and like I said, it is an actual trust fund, and nothing else can be done with that money except uh, having it paid out as a match to all the 177 communities that currently have CPA. So we are trending upward on those matches. Um, it looks like this year's match, the one that'll come out um, in November, um, which is a match for last year's uh, local money that was raised, is looking like it's gonna be in the 25 to 30% range. Um, and that uh, general range should be um, the case for the, for the foreseeable uh, short-term future anyways. Um, Franklin's gonna receive its first match in November of 2022. You get it after the end of your first year in the program. So um, certainly that number will probably hold true um, in, in 2022 when Franklin receives its first match if it decides to adopt the program. Next slide, Steve. So as I mentioned, um, when you are calculating the local surcharge, it is a 2% surcharge on your local annual property tax bill, but there are some exemptions. So you don't pay 2% on the full amount that you pay in property taxes. And I'm going to show you actually an example in a few minutes of actually how the surcharge is calculated. So you can really see exactly um, how much you'll be paying by looking at your own tax bill. Um, but the town council in Franklin adopted two exemptions to the surcharge. The first is that $100,000 of value of residential property will be automatically exempt. So if you have a home in Franklin um, that's worth less than $100,000, probably not too many, anywhere in the Commonwealth that are worth less than $100,000, but if you do, you wouldn't pay any CPA surcharge. If you have a house valued at $200,000, you would only pay the CPA surcharge, the 2% on the tax for half that value, 100,000. If you have a $900,000 um, value home, you would pay the CPA surcharge on $800,000 uh, of tax value. And we'll step through again an example and show you how that works in a minute. In addition, low income families and low and moderate income seniors are exempt from the program. There's actually a chart on our website of communitypreservation.org. I think we show that URL at the end of the presentation. And we have a chart that shows what those income levels are, what it means to be a low income family and a low and moderate income senior. Uh, but if you fall under those um, uh, amounts, you are also exempt from the program. Um, Folks that already receive a property tax exemption of some type already, there are different property tax ex exemptions for folks um, who are veterans, um, who are seniors, tax work-off programs, um, blind individuals. Um, the 
uh, that will apply to the CPA as well. So if you already get a break on your, on your taxes, you're not going to pay the full amount of your CPA surcharge. You're going to receive a pro rata reduction in the surcharge based on how much tax you actually pay after you get those exemptions. So here's the chart I was talking about. So um, as I mentioned, the surcharge that's being proposed for Franklin is a 2% surcharge. So let's step through an example. Um, for this example, we chose the average um, assessed value home value in, in Franklin, which is 460,000. That can vary, depend upon which data source you use for average values. There's a number of different ways to calculate it, but um, it's in that general vicinity. And um, uh, for the purposes of this example, we can use really any number. So since Franklin has chosen the $100,000 residential exemption, the first thing that happens is the assessing office will automatically, uh, in calculating your local surcharge for CPA, remove $100,000 from your assessed value of your house. So that leaves $360,000, and that's what the CPA surcharge will be calculated on. The tax rate in um, Franklin right now is $14.51 per thousand. So you multiply that out, and $5,229 of your property tax bill that year would be subject to that 2% surcharge. So this particular homeowner, the one that had a home valued at $460,000, would pay $105 annually toward the CPA fund. And um, I believe you probably have four time a year tax billing in Franklin, like most other communities. So that number will be divided by four. So it'll appear on each tax bill, um, uh, roughly 20, well, 20, a little over $25, right? On each tax bill um, that would be paid into the Franklin local fund uh, from CPA. So you can do the same calculation. It's pretty simple um, by taking your average assessed value, take 100,000 right off the top. That's the uh, new net value that'll be surcharged. Um, multiply that times the tax rate uh, and you'll be able to calculate your local surcharge by using this chart. And I'm assuming this, um, I know this presentation is being recorded and so you'll be able to access this chart if you ever needed a little jog in your memory as to how to do this uh, calculation. Um, it'll be there for you. Next slide, Steve. All right, so let's say the community does decide on November 3rd that they want to adopt CPA. Um, the next step is that um, the town council will establish a community preservation committee. Um, that committee is anywhere from five to nine members. You're looking at the uh, CPA committee out in West Stockbridge, um, Massachusetts, Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Um, West Stockbridge actually just adopted CPA a couple months ago, but this is Stockbridge, which has had CPA for over 20 years. Um, they're at the site of uh, Habitat for Humanity development, actually, that's going up uh, a few years ago in Stockbridge. So that uh, committee can have anywhere from five to nine members, and the town council will make a decision on that. Um, it's required by the law to have a representative on the CPA committee from the Conservation Commission, the Historic Commission, the Planning Board, the Recreation or Parks Department, however you would call it in Franklin, and also the local housing authority. So the idea here is that you're going to get a broad cross-section of the community that is going to be looking at what to do with this funding. In addition, most communities appoint four additional members to the CPA community from the citizens at large in Franklin. So most committees have a nine member, uh, nine members, some have seven, but by and large, this is the formula you see on your screen now that most communities have. And the job of this community preservation committee is really to get out and study the needs of what Franklin um, uh, is short on in these categories. What parks need rehabilitating? What parts of the community don't have enough parks where we need to buy, build new ones perhaps. Um, where's the need for um, housing? Is it, uh, we don't have enough senior housing? We don't have enough family housing? Is there a shortage of rentals? Um, what historic buildings are really um, important to, main, uh, to, to keep uh, in good shape in Franklin that are really make the fabric of your community and make it really uh, unique to Franklin. What are those, some of those assets that can be rehabilitated or even important documents that are at the library? Um, those are some of the things that the Community Preservation Committee studies um, and then they make recommendations on spending the money. The committee itself can't spend a penny. They can only make recommendations to the town council 
and then the final decision is made just like all expenditures uh, by the town council. So next slide, Steve. All right, so the flow of a typical um, CPA uh, project season um, in CPA communities is this. Um, most communities establish an application procedure uh, to accept applications, and there's usually a, a deadline once a year, perhaps twice a year, where uh, folks and really anyone in the community can submit a proposal to the Community Preservation Committee uh, on what they'd like to see done in town. So folks submit those applications to the CPC. The CPC reviews them, um, gets input from all the other boards and committees in town and anyone else who wants to uh, provide some input on it. Um, they then vote on a recommended list of projects um, once or twice a year, depending upon how it's set up in your community. It's completely up to the community how they set it up. Uh, and then the legislative body, which is your town council, is required um, to ratify that recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee, and then the projects happen. So across the state, we have seen, uh, you saw on that slide, there have been over 12,000 projects. Um, and um, in the short time we have left, and I'm not gonna go through all 12,000, but we did pick you know, some basic themes of what CPA is used for. And it's really incredible um, when you look across the state, what folks have done and how creative communities have been and how localized um, they've made their program uh, by determining what's really important to them. Um, so let's step through a couple of examples of what you can do with your CPA funding once you have the program. Next slide. All right, so I'll uh, start out with the historic preservation category. So. Um, one of the most popular areas of CPA is restoring historic municipal buildings. Um, lots of communities have um, libraries, even fire stations, town halls, uh, city halls, um, grange halls. We did the uh, local grange hall in our building, in our community up on the North Shore. I live uh, in Boxford, Massachusetts. We did a top to bottom rehab of our grange hall from 1910 that's used as a meeting space. Um, in the top left here, you're going to see the picture of Gloucester City Hall. This is a really, truly iconic building um, that uh, was designed so that as the fishermen make the last turn into Gloucester Harbor and they look up at the home port, that's what they see, that big spire mm -hmm. in Gloucester. Uh, unfortunately, there was a problem. Every time the wind blew over 40 knots, that, that uh, tower was about to fall down and they had to evacuate the building every time the wind picked up over 40 knots. And CPA to the rescue, um, the first project that the CPA committee recommended and the city council approved in Gloucester after they passed it a few years ago was a $3 million rehabilitation of that building um, and particularly the, uh, the spire as well, uh, the tower, I guess. Um, it's not a church, it's a, it's a town hall. Um, that that fisheye photo from uh, high atop Needham Town Hall is of a worker putting the gold leaf back on Needham Town Hall. That still to this day is the largest ever CPA project. It was a $15 million uh, top to bottom rehab of Needham Town Hall. Um, to the bottom left, um, you know, dozens of town halls in Massachusetts have these uh, spectacular meeting rooms upstairs. That's kind of the, the classic the New England meeting house format. And this one I think happens to be in Tingsboro that was completely uh, rehabilitated top to bottom. Next slide. Um, Historic buildings um, often have new lives. So bottom left, the Cohasset, um, old Cohasset Library was turned into affordable housing. Um, in the top right, an old factory in Middleborough, the shoe, the shoe factory in Middleborough was turned into um, affordable housing and senior housing. Um, and down the bottom with all those gold shovels, the Chelmsford's about to break ground on rehabilitating their um, town hall, their old town hall into a community center. Next slide. Um, nonprofits also receive CPA money. It's not just spent on uh, municipal assets, but nonprofits like the Abigail Adams Society, which that brown house in the bottom right um, was completely rehabbed with CPA money. Um, and any of you who've been to Northampton, you've seen the Academy of Music right on the main drive there. Um, top left is one of my favorite projects. That's a, um, uh, a factory in Westboro, I'm sorry, um, Westfield, not Westboro. It's the last remaining whip factory. Um, West, uh, Westfield is the whip city. They used to have about a dozen whip factories and I'm talking horse and buggy whips in Westfield. This is the last remaining one. 
Um, they did some rehabilitation on that building and they're turning it into a museum of the history of the, the whip city and the whip manufacturing in, um, in Westfield. Next slide. Um, it's not just buildings, documents too. Um, you know, lots of communities have beautiful historic documents. We've had three copies, local copies of the Declaration of Independence that have been restored with CPA funding. Um, and so documents, artifacts uh, are all fair game for funding with CPA. Next slide. Um, all right, so let's move on to the other categories um, quickly before we turn this over to, to Barry. Um, agricultural land is a, a big use of CPA funding, um, and not just in, um, you know, Western Mass, obviously, where we have lots of agriculture, but that farm in the top right is in Newton, Massachusetts. That's the last remaining farm in Newton, and the city bought it with CPA money, um, rehabilitated the barn and the um, um, farm keeper's house with CPA funds, and it's now run as a community supported agriculture uh, farm right in Newton. So people can walk down the street in a really packed, um, dense uh, city and get fresh vegetables in Newton now. Um, so agricultural land and um, uh, cropland and um, hay fields, uh, uh, anything like that is fair game for CPA protection. Next slide. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, CPA communities protect really vulnerable land, um, uh, you know, rare species of plants or habitats or uh, bottom left is the Great Marsh, the largest contiguous um, marsh on the eastern seaboard between North Carolina and Canada and it's up on the North Shore of Massachusetts and that huge swath of land was protected in rally with, with CPA funds. Next slide. Um, a lot of communities um, protect their drinking water with CPA, and in fact, that le often leads them to purchase land in other communities. Um, top right, um, uh, Cambridge's reservoir is completely protected with land they acquired by CPA, and a lot of the land is in the, in the town of Lincoln. It's actually in a different town, and they bought land around their reservoir in Lincoln to protect their public drinking water supply. Next slide. Um, so the active part of recreation we talked about, um, playgrounds, we've had, you know, at this point, probably hundreds of playgrounds in Massachusetts that have been rehabilitated with CPA funds. Um, and a lot of them are rehabilitated as fully handicapped accessible playgrounds, um, which is obviously something that's very important right now. Um, and a lot of these um, uh, playgrounds were not built with handicapped accessibility in mind. Next slide. Um, Parks, as I said, parks, playgrounds, and athletic fields. That's kind of like the, the big trio in the recreation category. Um, and we've also had communities not only rehabilitate their uh, recreation fields, but actually build brand new recreational complexes from scratch. Um, and bottom right, that's what they did in Bridgewater uh, with a brand new um, softball field, basketball courts, the whole bit, um, all on land purchased with CPA money and then the money used to build the facilities as well. Next slide. Um, rail trails are really popular with CPA, hiking trails, biking trails, um, all those sort of different conversions, um, not only buying the land, but then also actually building the trails as well. Next slide. Um, and as I mentioned, parks, um, and they can be small little pocket parks like we have down the bottom right, which is a, just a little small connection between two streets in Barnstable that used to be just sort of a, you know, a, a dilapidated, rock-strewn, overgrown um, you know, no man's land, and they built this nice little pocket park to connect these two streets in, in Barnstable. Um, skateboard parks, you mentioned it, uh, you know, you mentioned it, we've seen it in CPA in terms of, of parks and athletic facilities. And community gardens, of course, that's the last uh, part of CPA, like um, um, Newton did and, and many other communities. Ashland, I think these photos are from Ashland, where they have a really strong community garden program. All right, the last category that we're gonna talk about, um, and then we're gonna turn it over to, uh, to Barry to talk a little bit more about his experience with CPA, uh, is the um, affordable housing or what CPA refers to as the community housing category. Um, and uh, the misnomer with CPA is that um, it's similar to uh, 40B or very low income housing. It's actually up to the community how they wanna handle this. Um, and you can go up to 100% of the area wide median income. Um, with CPA. It's not limited to just a uh, very low income. Uh, and it's not the same as 40B. Um, you know, 40B bypasses many local approvals. Um, as a CPA project, every single one has to get local approval from both the CPC and the town council. So you really have control over what you want to build 
where you wanna build it and what you want it to look like. Um, we've also had a lot of specialty housing built, not just the traditional um, housing for families or seniors, but um, these are three communities of the six that have built housing for veterans with CPA funds. Next slide. Um, in the same um, vein as uh, a lot of CPA projects, you can combine categories. So you can take um, an abandoned um, historic building or in the case of North Andover in the bottom left-hand corner, an abandoned, closed, and dilapidated old um, nursing home and um, adapt uh, the new use to that building and uh, turn it into housing. Um, bottom right and top right, um, that's the old Ames Shovel Factory in Easton, um, where most shovels in America were made around the turn of the century, is now um, terrific affordable and market rate housing. Um, this is one of my favorite projects. This is an old printing factory in Lexington that they turned into a 12 unit home for folks with brain injuries using CPA funds to completely rehab the building. This was so successful that the nonprofit that did this, a company called Supportive Living Incorporated, uh, did the same thing up in Rockport in a closed inn up there. Um, and then I think this is probably the last slide. Um, uh, different um, community can really get involved in these projects. Um, bottom left is all the kids from the local technical high school that are helping build the affordable housing in, um, in uh, Lincoln and uh, learning on the, on the job. Um, Habitat for Humanity also has been a terrific partner. Dozens and dozens of units have been built with Habitat with CPA. And um, the last thing, as I promised, a quick look at the website that our organization runs where you can get more information on CPA. It's communitypreservation.org. And that little tab over to the right where we have the big red arrow is um, the section called Adopting CPA, where you can get a ton of information um, on CPA, the things that I didn't cover tonight, and um, a recap of the things we did. So that's it for me. I'll, be, I'll stick around and I'd be happy to answer questions. Indeed. Thank you. Hey. And Hi. Monique, while I unmute Barry, uh, you can do the introduction. Thank you, Stuart. That was very, very helpful. And I'm sure our community will be very, is very grateful for your advice and presentation. I'd like to introduce now Barry Kessler. Barry is a Franklin resident now. And he has been invaluable in his advice and encouragement to our CPA committee. Uh, before that, he was chairman, he was responsible for bringing the CPA to our neighboring town of Rentham. And he was chair of the Rentham Community Preservation Act. He is also now a program administrator for the CPA Commission in Stoughton, and he has had that position since 2016 until the present and is still part of that group. So I'd like Barry, thank you very much, Barry, for helping us, and we looking forward to your presentation. Well, thanks, Monique. Uh, my name is Barry Kassler, and uh, as, she, as Monique said, I'm going to speak about two CPA towns I'm familiar with, Rentham and Stoughton. My wife and I moved to Franklin from Rentham earlier this year. And in Rentham, I was chairman of the Rentham Community Preservation Committee, also known as the CPC for short, from its founding in 2017 uh, until last year when I moved uh, from Rentham to Franklin. Also, as Monique mentioned, I currently serve as the program administrator for Stoughton's Community Preservation Committee, and I've been in that role since 2016. After I started working for Stoughton's CPC, Community Preservation Committee, I realized what an advantage the CPA could be for what was then my hometown of Rentham. So I worked to get the CPA onto the ballot there and we did get it on the ballot in November of 2016. And uh, when the votes were counted, it had passed by a majority of over, over two to one. Um, the town of Stoughton had adopted the CPA before I started working there back in 2008. And the motivation for Stoughton to put the CPA on the ballot was open space and one large parcel in particular uh, that the owner had always wanted to, to have the town take ownership of. And that was their main motivation. Um, they passed CPA in Stoughton. And uh, after it was passed, Stoughton did acquire that particular property um, because that was early on in Stoughton's uh, history with the CPA that didn't have enough money 
in their fund to purchase it. So they bonded the full purchase price. In other words, they borrowed money against future local receipts in order to purchase it. The Community Preservation Committee can, can decide to accept applications, uh, as Stuart said, uh, on a fixed schedule, either once or twice a year. And in Stoughton and Rentham, that's what they do because Stoughton and Rentham are town meeting towns and it makes sense because that meshes with the calendar for town meeting. Uh, where Franklin's a town council town, um, you may wanna have open enrollments year round um, because the, the town council meets fairly often. Um, so they have a little more flexibility, but again, um, it, it's up to the community preservation committee to decide how that should be structured. Um, so applications can also be accepted um, beyond the deadlines in certain urgent cases. Uh, for example, if you have a land uh, purchase that needs to be decided on right away, um, or if you have, for example, historical uh, preservation issue that has to be decided on and can't wait, then uh, the Community Preservation Committee, the CPC, can decide to take that application right away and deal with it and make a recommendation uh, as soon as possible. Uh, in Rentham, 2019, just last year, was Rentham's first full year of accepting applications from applicants. And uh, we received applications for eight proposals. Um, six of those proposals were ultimately approved um, with the full amount requested to town meeting. Um, one of them was not recommended and one was recommended only in part. So we had seven projects uh, that were recommended for approval by town meeting. And of those seven, all seven were approved the way the Community Preservation Committee recommended them. Uh, I, I've checked with my friends in Rentham and uh, currently three of those projects are substantially complete and the rest are in, in progress and in various stages of completion. And uh, this year I understand that there will be four new CPA projects that will be coming up at Fall Special Town Meeting in Rentham. Uh, Stoughton's history is that it has averaged roughly two or three proposals a year that the Community Preservation Committee has recommended to town meeting. But again, that varies from year to year. Um, at this past year's annual town meeting uh, was supposed to be in May, ended up being June. Um, the two projects that were recommended by the Community Preservation Committee were both approved. One of those projects was a joint venture with the town of Canton um, to repair and preserve a scrapbook of historic documents that to me was really fascinating because the documents are, many of them are they're all original documents, many of them go back to the 1600s. Um, and they had been assembled in a scrapbook in the late 1800s by uh, someone who had a lot of interest in preserving the history of the town. But at that time, the historic, historic preservation standards were not anywhere what they are today. So they were put together using things like rubber cement and you know gluing things together and which would just be definitely not acceptable today. So what's going to happen uh, and what, what is being done now is that uh, a, uh, a company that specializes in historic preservation is very painstakingly taking those documents and preserving each one individually and putting it back together and preserving it um, so that anyone uh, can, can access it online and, and do whatever research they'd like to do. Um, Stoughton also had a very interesting second proposal which was accepted and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, earlier in, in, in Stoughton, in previous years, um, the, the towns, uh, both towns, right, the man Stoughton, um, have followed the recommendations of the Community Preservation Committee very closely. Um, the only, there's only one time that I know of that a uh, project was recommended in either town that did not pass a town meeting, but every other project that was recommended was passed by town meeting. And that's because the town pretty much trusts that the Community Preservation Committee is doing its job to thoroughly vet the applications that come before it, thoroughly research the project, ask all the pertinent questions. They uh, get a full rundown of the budget. And if it's a construction project, what the timeline is expected to be. Um, so again, that engenders a lot of trust in the legislative body for the work of the CPC. It also puts a lot of pressure on the CPC to make sure they do their job right. Um, last year, three of Rentham's uh, projects were, um, Rentham has three major lakes and each of them was represented by a community group that sought to combat invasive weeds. And they each had a slightly different approach to the problem. And um, so those are all uh, in progress. Uh, going back to Stoughton for a moment, one of the projects that's currently under review, Stoughton has a, a, a unique 
a railroad station in the center of town, which the town purchased from the MBTA last year. And um, there's currently a proposal to rehabilitate that station to bring it up to, uh, to its former grandeur, basically. Uh, it's, it's a nice building. It's, it's impressive enough that a Hollywood film was filmed there using um, parts of the interior uh, as a set. And uh, there's, there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, the town is trying to, uh, is asking for the money to rehabilitate the rest of the building. Um, both Stoughton and Rentham have put their CPA funds to good use, reconstructing playgrounds, something that Stuart mentioned, uh, and, and building new ones. And, and yes, there's been a lot of attention paid to making sure that they are ADA compliant. Um, and I just want to say that having a CPA fund allows a town to better provide those kind of recreational opportunities for the children in their town. And that's more than you could do um, just by with your general budget alone. Um, in Stoughton, uh, this is the going back to the second proposal, which Stoughton Town Meeting approved this year. Uh, the CPC, seeing that the pandemic had left a lot of people in financial hard, you know, in financial straits, people losing their jobs, and people having difficulty uh, providing the funds they needed to pay for housing, the Stoughton Community Preservation Committee decided to set up a housing fund uh, for people who could apply. Um, have, they had to make certain in income criteria and they could apply to have uh, assistance from this fund um, to help them pay for their rent. And uh, that, that proposal was um, presented to Stoughton Town Meeting and uh, that was also passed. And that, pro that project is currently underway. And um, there have been a number of Stoughton households who have um, applied and um, been able to be helped by that program. So we're, we're very proud of that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's been a very successful program um, in the years that Stoughton is instituted the CPA, um, just going back to something Stuart mentioned about the state uh, trust fund, Stoughton has in that time collected over $1.7 million, and that's money that it would not have seen if it hadn't accepted the CPA in 2008. Franklin, if we accept the CPA on our ballot in November, we will now be able to share in that fund, and uh, that's money that Franklin currently does pay, because every time you file a deed with the Registry of Deeds, it's a deeds excise tax. So we're already paying into that fund. If we accept the CPA, we will now be able to share it. And uh, the way things are set up now, we'll be able to get back more than what we had been paying in per year, for each year. So that's a good thing to look forward to. Um, as I said earlier, I moved to Franklin earlier this year and did not realize there was already an effort underway uh, to have the CPA accepted in this town. I was more than happy to find out that that was the case. And, when I learned that, I was uh, glad to, I was asked to help out and I was glad to offer my help to the, uh, to the Franklin group that's trying to get the CPA passed. And uh, I, I urge everyone watching and listening to vote yes on question three, to adopt the CPA in Franklin on the November ballot because I think it makes very good sense for a community fiscally and otherwise. Thanks very much. Thanks, Barry. And Thank you, Stuart, for the presentation intro. Uh, in our Q&A section, we've got some questions queued up here. Uh, so there was one, not sure if it was already said, is there a pro projection on how much would be added to the CPA fund in the first year if it's voted in? I can and, take yep. that. Sure. Um, hi, my name is Susan Spears. I'm active on the CPA for Franklin Committee. Thank you all for coming. Um, on the uh, materials that our town administrator, Jamie Helen, prepared when the town council was considering this um, during the winter, spring, and early summer, he has prepared a series of materials that are still posted on the um, town website, and I think that we have a link to those materials on our website, cpa4franklin.org. And I, as I recall, um, the answer to that question is that if we do it um, this year, in the coming year, he anticipated that the fund would bring in more than $1 million. Um, I'm not sure if that includes all the possible people who might apply for exemptions, but certainly that is the overall scale of what we're talking about. 
we did a calculation ourselves, um, Susan, and, and came out with something similar, actually slightly more, um, possibly up to $1.2 million. So it'll be somewhere in that range. And that's just the local money. The state match would be on top of that. And that's, I think it's one of the related questions to state match. Clearly, as I think you mentioned and Barry mentioned, it varies from year to year. And your projection this year uh, was in what, the 20 plus range? We think it'll be 25 to 30%. Yep. And if we pass, then our first uh, fund starts would only be in 2022, to right. be correct, I think. Right. So the way it would work is you're voting on November 3rd. Um, if CPA passes at the ballot, then in the springtime, the committee will be set up. And then on July 1st, 2021, which is the beginning of um, FY22, that's when the surcharge will be first assessed on the local taxes. So the uh, city will collect um, an entire year's surcharge. So you'll collect your first year of CPA locally from July 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2022. Uh, you'll let the Department of Revenue know in our first year of CPA, we collected $1.1 million, whatever it is. Uh, and they will send you your first match in November of 2022, um, which will be a match for what you collected the year before. So you always get your state match at the end of the year. So you tell them how much you collected, and then they send a check to the community on November 15th. Okay, from the chat session, we've got a related question in regards to as more towns adopt CPA, will the percent match from the state diminish as the state pie is divided be amongst more towns? Mathematically, I would think that's possible, but I think you also mentioned that the, the fund itself got some technical increases in it too. So it'll right. be interesting to see how it plays out. So um, the, the, que the person, the question the person asked is exactly the situation we were in. So um, CPA was passed in, in 2000. They set the fees at the registry of deeds. Um, every time you file most documents, it's $20. And that $20 is collected at the window of the registry and goes right to the CPA trust fund. Um, in the beginning, that was enough to give everyone a really robust match. But then exactly like the person said, more and more communities adopted CPA, it became very popular, um, and the match went down. So one of the things that our organization does as, um, you know, the statewide, uh, you know, association that represents CPA is we started talking to the legislature and is showing them that the match was going down because the program was incredibly popular. Um, and uh, they, they responded very favorably. They know that CPA is very popular in the state and they have done two things. So the first thing they did is for six years, um, they added extra money to the trust fund from the state budget surplus. Um, the state will not have a budget surplus this year and perhaps not for a couple of more years. In the past, the state almost always had a surplus. And so because CPA um, was so popular and the match had been going down for more communities, uh, for six years, they put um, a total of about $80 million additional funding into the trust fund, which kept the match uh, propped up. But of course, that was year to year. And that's not exactly what we had in mind because um, some years the legislature might not be able to do that, like this year. Um, good timing for us that we went back to them and said, the surplus money is great, but that fee at the Registry of Deeds has not been adjusted in 20 years. It's still the same $20 per document. And we had 37 communities the first year in CPA, and now we have 177. And so to avoid that match you know, going down so far, um, we asked the legislature to raise that fee. It took a number of years to get them to agree, uh, but they did. And then um, last August, uh, Governor Baker signed a bill that increased the surcharge at the registry um, to $50 per document. Um, so that's the first increase in 20 years. Um, and that's why the match is now much higher. Um, I think that obviously as more communities come in, it'll tend to shift down again and we'll spring back into action just like we've done twice before um, to make sure the match uh, is propped up. I will tell you though, when you already have half the state in CPA, the amount of new communities coming in is much smaller. Um, as, a, as an example, the presidential election year 
is one of the most popular times to, um, to put CPA on the ballot because it brings in the widest number of people to vote on it. And a decision like this, you know, should be decided by as many people as possible in town. So uh, four years ago on the presidential election, we had 17 communities voting on CPA. This year, there are half that, only, only nine communities voting on CPA. So when you have half the communities in the state, the program's not for everybody. So we're not seeing the type of robust, um, you know, many, many, many communities coming in like it was for a number of years. So although, yes, it's true that every time someone comes in, the match will fall by a tiny bit. Um, you know, we're starting from a much higher level now because of the new increase, and we're just not seeing as many communities adopt CPA because we already have uh, over half the state. Thank you. Uh, next question is in regards to when a committee, when the committee gets a proposal to use the funds, what's the process to approve the use of the funds? And unfortunately, Barry just had to tap away. Okay, I can. You can stop on that and I can add to that, I think, from my understanding of what the process is or what should be. Um, if you're not tired of listening to me talk, I can answer that question too. <laughs> um, well, let me, let me, to give you a break, let me just try a little bit and then uh, you can add to it. So if I recall on your, one of your slides, you mentioned the number of representatives from the various boards, historical commission, planning department, et cetera, or planning board, et cetera, and then potentially up to nine. I think you said most had nine members, some had seven. Um, they would be vetting the proposals. So evaluating, doing the due diligence, the project as proposed would effectively require whether it's a group or a nonprofit or whatever to, to answer those questions so that the committee would then make a recommendation or some recommendation to the town council. The town council would be the one that has the final yes or no in terms of the actual expenditure. I think one of the points you made before is the committee just makes the recommendations. We don't actually, the committee doesn't actually have a budget. Yep. That's, that's exactly right. And um, uh, typically um, that process plays out over two, three, maybe more meetings of the Community Preservation Committee as they um, ask questions and ask for more information. And then uh, in, in almost all cases, you know, the public is invited to the meetings and can come and learn about the projects and ask questions themselves um, as well. So in a lot of communities, it's not required to have a public hearing um, at the end of that process, but most communities do, um, where they present the final slate of projects that are going to go before uh, the town council. And from my observational road and role, and I think most people would re recognize that, I think a proposal, having had much more open and transparency and involved engagement with the community, would help to vet the project and thereby answer the question so that by the time the town council got it, then they would have said had some time to be able to make a, quote, an easy decision. Uh, but they would still, hopefully they, we wouldn't just dump so that they would have to do more work. That process wouldn't work. <laughs> yeah. Those were the questions in the chat. If somebody has another question, if you want to raise your hand, I can unmute you and we can go that way. Steve, I just wanted to point out that we did answer a very similar question to this last one in a Q&A that's posted both on our Facebook group and on the website. Um, someone asked that question a couple of weeks ago and Barry drafted a very nice explanation of this process based on his experience of um, using an open public meeting format so that there is adequate and thorough public involvement in considering the proposed projects. He also mentioned, Stuart, I'm not sure if you um, can explain to us, Barry had mentioned that the CPCs actually have to prepare an annual report who would that go to in a, in a town council form of government? Um, so there's actually 
there's actually um, a requirement called the Community Preservation Plan. Um, so when the committee is first appointed, they need to study the needs of the community, and that does require a public hearing once a year. Um, so they start the process by asking the community to come in to the public hearing and say, what, what needs should we be looking at? What sort of things are necessary uh, in these four categories in CPA uh, in Franklin? Um, and then they are required to write an annual plan for that. Um, and that kicks off the process. And then every year they update that plan and have a new public hearing to get input from, from the public. Um, they're also required to, um, one of the great things about CPA is it's really um, hyper local in terms of what happens with the money. You know, some projects are very small, some are big, but every single project, um, the state requires the communities to list about 50 data points on that project. Not only the name of the project, the description, um, the amount of money, where the money. Oops. We just lost Stuart. The first technical glitch. <laughs> it's frozen. Did I freeze? There you, 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 you froze. You froze for a little while. He's myself, so I kept talking. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> data points? That database is... Um, uh, kept by the state and um, you can search through every community and you can say show me the historic projects that um, the town of Northboro did in 2012 and they'll pop up right on the screen and so uh, Franklin would be required to do the same thing every year those projects would have to go into the database um, maintained by the state they'd be there forever and everyone can look at those exactly what's been done with the money. Um, which is really rare. And a lot of times the money disappears into the black hole of uh, City Hall and you don't know what happens to your tax money. Uh, but with CPA, you can know exactly what it is by looking in this, uh, in this database every single year. Um, and I invite you to go to our website. We have a, a version of that database on our website, communitypreservation.org, um, and look up some projects. Just pick a community that you're familiar with or you travel to or you go to. Um, look at what they've done. You'll probably recognize some of the things you've seen, a park that you've seen or a, a recreational facility you've gone to or a housing development you might have driven by. You, you can actually um, look at that database. It's kind of neat. And I think, Tony, you had a question? Uh, yeah, I was interested in um, how difficult is it to submit a proposal? I mean, is there a standard format that, that uh, CPA or the state requires? No, um, one of the great things about CPA is there is a very little, um, almost no um, state requirements on how you run your program locally. Um, the committee is structured in the way I discussed it, but beyond that, the state's law and the state say nothing about how you conduct your program. So it's really determined locally um, by the committee and how they set it up. Um, most communities, it doesn't even say you have to use an application process, but almost all communities do. Um, but the applications vary. Um, you know, in Boston, um, which is new to the program, uh, being a big city, you know, they might get 100 applications a year. Their application is online and it's pretty darn detailed. Um, in some of the small towns that don't have a paid professional staff uh, in town, the application is one page handwritten. So it really depends upon the community and they can decide, you know, um, that process, the Community Preservation Committee decides that process. There is not a, a form that the state forces you to use um, or particular information the state um, forces you to gather. It's really, uh, the great thing about CPA is it is completely controlled locally. One of the reasons for my question is those 50 data points you just talked about that the state has, where do those come from if I don't submit them? in my proposal. So that's at the end of the year. So once the project has gone through the vetting process, uh, the application comes in, the Community Preservation Committee asks all the questions they need to, gathers all the data on the project, does their due diligence, and they send all the specifics to the town council. Um, the town council votes on the project and it is funded. Then at that point, the town um, is responsible for going into that database and typing in all those 50 data points. So that's at the end of the process. Once the appropriation has been made at the, at the town council, that's when the projects are entered in the database and so, um, that information. Uh, question. So if the project doesn't 
uh, isn't recommended by by the local committee or isn't approved by the town council, um, th is that information still captured at the state level? It'd be nice to know what has been, po been proposed in the past that wasn't successful, and maybe we want to re revisit that and send it again. Right. Yeah, no, that is not captured by the state. Um, uh, I don't know why they don't do that, but I have, a, I have a suspicion as to why they don't do that. And Barry alluded to this in what he talked about. Um, the vetting process by the Community Preservation Committee is usually pretty darn thorough. And then usually the legislative body, town council, does their own vetting process. So um, we don't see many projects when they finally reach the stage that they're being recommended by the CPC, very few get uh, voted down by the town council or a town meeting. It's pretty rare, actually. Um, it does happen, of course, but so you see, you know, by the time the process plays out and you get all the way to the end of the process and it finally goes in front of the legislative body, yes. a, a very high number of projects that are approved. Um, so there aren't a lot of dead applications of projects that didn't go anywhere. It's just, it just hasn't played out that way. Um, but to answer your question, no, those aren't tracked at the state level. So you would basically just ask your community preservation committee, they're required to keep records of everything they do, um, just like any town board, and they, ha they would have copies of every application that came in locally. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Anybody else? This is our opportunity to um, have... Sorry. No, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure we give somebody else a chance. Not, and if you're just asking it on their behalf as well in that case, <laughs> potentially. Um, but seeing nobody else with a hand at the moment, let's go, Tony, give you another shot. Steve, you might want to explain to people how to raise their hand because I always forget and it's not that obvious <laughs> as to how you, what button you hit to raise your hand. Yeah, there is a, well, you can, phys if you have audio, I mean, the video on, you can physically raise your hand. That's how I saw Tony's at first. Um, but there is a button within Zoom to raise your hand to uh, invite somebody else, et cetera. So, Tony, are you unmuted? Yeah, you're unmuted. Yeah, I, just a question. That uh, that extra funding that uh, we now require the uh, the, 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 the registry to, uh, to collect, I was wondering, where was the money going prior to CPA, who was getting the money from the deeds registry? That is a great question. Mm. The answer is there was no money because this fee was created specifically for CPA. So the fee did not exist before 2000. So the registry has always charged a certain amount for documents mm. and, and they vary. If you file a deed, I think it's $125. If you file a, a mortgage at the registry, it's $75. Um, I'm, I'm not getting these figures exactly right, but um, basically the $20 for CPA was a surcharge added on top of the existing fee. So the registry fees were actually pretty low in Massachusetts. Um, uh, they were incredibly low. They were one of the lowest in the nation. Um, and then CPA was added on top of that. So that money didn't go anywhere. That was a new fee created for CPA. Unfortunately, Governor Romney um, raised all the fees in 2003, very shortly after CPA was passed, um, not just at the registry, but at the motor vehicles, every fee in the state went up dramatically in 2003. Um, so our registry fees are higher now, uh, but when CPA was first passed, that was a brand new fee added on top. Um, so it's not, that money didn't, uh, I think that's a, the reason that's such a great question is, did the CPA program steal someone else's lunch? You know, you always want to be careful right. about that. You know, CPA has very important needs, open space, historic preservation, parks, et cetera, affordable housing. But, you know, there are other needs in the Commonwealth too. Um, so um, that's a great question because um, that money did not come from anyone else's program. It was brand Thanks. Indeed. Thank you for that. Uh, as we start to wind down, uh, while you're thinking, in case you are still thinking, oh, let me ask this, et cetera, um, we do have a slide shared now. So what are we asking for you to do next? Um, please consider voting yes on question three, on or before the election day itself. Uh, the group is also looking for help with the CPA signs on election day and before. So if you can 
stand with your own sign or one provided, uh, there's an email, CPA4, the number for Franklin at gmail.com. Um, and this doc will get sent, uh, will get posted to the website. Um, so that you'll have this available. Uh, it's the standard notification. Um, and if you have a, still a question or want to have a speaker from the group come to your group, uh, use that email as well. And clearly while we may be closing off this evening, um, there are still questions to be asked. Uh, if there are still questions to be asked, then this group is in a position to try and answer those. So don't be bashful. The uh, website cpafranklin.org that I shared earlier is up, it's active. Um, there are some links as we mentioned in there to uh, go to the Community Preservation Coalition, to go to the town docs. Uh, there'll be additional questions and answers posted there as those come in. Thank you all for coming. It's been fun. Very, very informative um, for Stuart and Barry both to uh, have given us this hour of their time. Very, a lot of information. Thank yeah, you. Thank, thanks for having me. It's been great to meet folks in Franklin. And um, in addition to your local folks that can answer questions, we're happy to take uh, questions at the Community Preservation Coalition as well. So if you want to get in touch with me, communitypreservation.org. And um, Tony, we can continue the conversation tomorrow if you want to give a call to the office or anyone else that has questions. I'm, I'm happy to answer them. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all. Uh, as noted at the beginning, this was being recorded. So as the record recording is processed, it'll be shared to the CPA webpage and you can always come back and check in. I, from my own experience, the audio will probably be out there quicker and then the video will be sometime thereafter. So stay tuned. Thank for your, thanks for your interest and time tonight. And um, don't be bashful and ask questions and spread the word. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, all. Thank you, all.